Greetings everybody, my name is Tommy the Keyblade Master and welcome to my channel. Well, we just retrieved the Master Sword, but Midna has no clue where to go about finding that mirror she wants. Time to head back to Hyrule Castle Town and back to Telma's bar and meet Telma's friends. One of them being Link's master from Ordon Village. Anyways, they say someone is waiting for you at Lake Hylia and they point to it on the map. Now you're free to explore Hyrule's massive field if you feel like goofing around. Now's your chance. But if you want to go quickly, head out of Hyrule's Castle South Gate and then just jump off a cliff leading directly to Lake Hylia. Head towards the direction of the desert. Basically go to Lanero Spring and then just follow the path that's on the wall that leads upwards. You will find a wolf stone that will allow you to howl to unlock a secret move. Do this will get you a powerful enough move right before you enter the Guru Fortress. Talk to Telma's friend and he will tell you the fortress used to be a prison in which they banished Hyrule's worst prisoners to another realm. Sounds like it might be worth checking out. He will give you something to give to the cannon guy below that launches you right to the desert. The game stops for a minute once you hit the desert for me to explain that she's of the tribe that Lanero was warning Link about that they tried to take over Hyrule a long time ago and for the punishment they were banished into the Twilight Realm. They have evolved into creatures who don't like the light anymore. But nonetheless they have been peaceful until Zant took over and Midna was banished. Anyways, several fan theories on who these people are. My favorite one, they were the Gerudo. Why? Because, well, you're in the Gerudo desert and there isn't a single Gerudo around in this game. They're completely vanished for some reason. So anyways, our next stop will be that Colosseum looking thing in the desert, but you're free to explore around if you want. But for the most part, the desert's a dead end. The desert in this game is beautiful, and it's kind of got this nice look out over Lake Hylia and from this direction and see the bridge and even Hyrule Castle but our true objective is getting into that freaking Colosseum like fortress believe it or not the second set of dungeons in this game have far less BS to get into them than the first set but there's still a lot of work to do after we get into the general area of the Colosseum we're going to be running into goblins you have to first knock these goblins off the ride Second area is a little harder. You have to find a key and get into the stable where you will meet... Oh no, not this guy again. Time to use that new quick draw move you learned plus a few black slice attacks to stun him. And watch out, he may swing slow but his attacks are long range and powerful. After a while he will admit defeat and then dishonorably burn down his own stable with you still in it. Steal his ride and bash through the remaining gates until you're at the fortress. Time for the real fun to begin. yee Okay, so technically this dungeon is called the Arbiter's Ground and not the Gerudo Fortress, but hey, can you blame me? It's fortress looking. It's in the middle of the Gerudo Desert. Anyways, this is one of the funnest dungeons in the game. It mixes the desert temple in with the graveyard one, and it leads to some interesting results. To get past the first part of the temple, you're going to need to find four pogos and defeat them to relight their light. Yeah, this is ripping off Ocarina of Time's forest temple big time, but this time you're Wolf Link, and you're going to be following their scents, and you're going to need to find them, and rip them apart in order to get those lights back. After you open up the second part starts and you will quickly find a new gear item. This kind of acts like this really cool ride you can hook up on walls and just go around real fast just bouncing off walls, riding through floors and all sorts of other neat stuff using this wheel ride. I'm willing to bet this is going to be used for all kinds of motion based puzzles in the future and it's going to be used in every dungeon, am I right? Damn it! <laughs> but this does show one of the problems with the Zelda Twilight Princess game. 
A lot of the dungeon items, especially found in later dungeons, are extremely cool to use. Unfortunately, they're only dungeon specific. After you completed the dungeon, this gear item along with several other items that you're about to collect will collect more dust than a Pokemon in a PC. And I'm not kidding on this. There's only one more time I think that you will need to use this gear as far as in a dungeon. There is a small overworld area that requires you to use the gear for an item but it's completely skippable. Outside of that, this item is worthless. Which is kind of a shame, it's so much fun to use in this dungeon. Oh well, at least the boss of this dungeon is really fun and makes good use of this item as well. Basically, you have to find a way to gain enough momentum while riding on the outside part of the dungeon so you can kind of surf in and hit him right on his back spine right there to take it out. Once you take out three pieces, or so he will be defeated and you will get one of the best fake outs in a video game. Normally you expect this boss is defeated when you get to the last boss or close to it, not in the middle of the game, but this guy does it. After you're done with him you have to solve a few more puzzles in that room and then surprise he springs back up to life and the next fight is a little bit tricky. Basically the outside wall will keep you in the same momentum and you won't go very fast. Well, the inside wall you will gain both altitude and momentum like crazy, so it's better to ride the inside wall where you can gain that altitude. Um, once you catch up to him by riding your little wheel thing, he'll start throwing out fireballs. Jump back and forth between the two walls to try to dodge him, and once you get close to him, smack him again, and he will go down, get off your wheel, and hit that little sword sticking out of his head with the master sword a few times and then he will get up and you will have to fight him again this time he will have more traps waiting for you as you try to gain your altitude it's extremely fun anyways after he's gone you will again have one or two more things you have to do before you can finally leave this room and oh yeah I should say the dungeon's not done yet also another unique thing about this dungeon, even though you've just defeated the boss, you still have more things to do. That's not much. You just go outside and you have to fight more of these shadow guys again as a wolf. Once they're gone, you ride your wheel up and you stick it in one of those gear things, turn it until a cutscene arrives. And let me tell you why this cutscene angers me so much. Alright, you see these guys here? These are supposed to be the Seven Sages. And who the heck are they? Here they're just these like ghostly people who wear masks because they have no faces. And they're never really explained why they're there. In Ocarina of Time and several other Zelda games, usually the Sages are different races of people throughout Hyrule that Link has to collect in order for them to come together to defeat Ganon in the end. In Ocarina of Time you had a Kokiri girl, the leader of the Goron tribe, Zora princess, a Sheikah, and a Grudu thief as members of the Sages. Here they're just monochrome white ghosts. And that royally ticks me off. They're nothing special, they're just shoehorned in here for some reason. And then, to top it all off, they bring Ganon back. So why is this a problem? Well, I don't care what timeline this is set in. If it's after Ocarina of Time, there's only two places where Ganon can be. He's either sealed off in some other realm, or he's dead. Here, he's just kind of brought back, so these guys can say that they sealed him away in some sort of convoluted backstory so that he can still be the source of the problems. No hero is brought in or anything. He's just there. And finally, this has been ticking me off this whole game, but this scene really ticks me off, is that for some reason Nintendo never decided to use the word Triforce, so it's always he's got a blessing from the gods or something. Why don't you call that mark on his hand for what it is? It's a symbol of the Triforce of Power. Ah! Scene royally ticks me off. 
But after it's over, we do find out, hey, if we want this mirror, we're going to have to go find some more MacGuffins. And it's off back to Telma's bar to find out where the next MacGuffin is. In the end, I really do enjoy this part. Getting into the desert is fun. Exploring the desert isn't half bad. Going past the goblin patrols is pretty fun. And I enjoy the puzzles in the item in this dungeon. And the dungeon boss fight, although somewhat frustrating, is still a lot of fun. The cutscene afterwards requires some more explaining than what it does, as it leaves more questions than answers, and it just shoehorns Ganon in, which I did not enjoy. But overall, I do enjoy this section of the game. And the great part about the next section is it's probably the shortest in the game. Let's go talk about what it takes to get into Snow Peak. In the meantime, I would like to thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. This is Tommy the Keyblade Master, signing out.